time because we have a packed and exciting agenda. Thank you everyone for joining us today for this exciting event. I'm Hedy Lawman, the Senior Managing Editor for the Journal on Education in Emergencies. And I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the participant audio and video are disabled. Um, you can post questions using the Q&A function at any time throughout the presentation today. Uh, as you just heard, uh, the session is being recorded. Closed captioning is available in English and the recording and presentations will be shared on the INEE website following um, the presentation. And without further ado, I will pass it over to Paul Fife, Director of the Human Development Department at NORAD to get us started with a few opening remarks. Thank you, Hedy. Uh, it is a true pleasure uh, for Nora to welcome you to the launch of the new volume of the Journal on Education Emergencies. Uh, delivering on the universal right to education is one of the most important development investments we can make. There are still many children and youth that do not go to school and the pandemic has worsened the situation. Children and young people who are affected by crisis, conflict and displacement are among the least likely to go to school, we know this. Support to education in emergencies continues to be a Norwegian priority. We work with several partners, such as Education Cannot Wait, UN organizations, civil society, and researchers to improve education for children and young people affected by crisis and conflict. And that includes obviously refugees and also internally displaced. We have also been a long time standing support and member of the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies. Norway is also concerned about the protection of schools and students. Together with Argentina, Norway led a process to develop the Safe Schools Declaration. We are also very glad that the Security Council, based on a proposal from Norway and Niger, recently adopted a resolution dedicated to the protection of education in conflict. Evidence and knowledge about what works is key to make development efforts effective and is a guiding principle for Nor NORAD's development assistance. In this regard, the Interagency Network for Education Emergencies, as well as the Journal on Education in Emergencies, play a very important role in informing and shaping the field of education in emergencies. School can be a safe haven amid the insecurity of daily life. Schools can provide protection, hope for the future, and an opportunity to process experiences. Living in crisis and conflict can lead to enormous mental stress. The pandemic has increased this stress. This journal, therefore, comes at the very right moment. It will advance our understanding of how, how psychological health, emotional well being, social cohesion, and education are linked. I am looking forward to this seminar and to listen to the presentations of the various articles in this new volume of the journal. Back to you, Hedy. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you to Norad for, uh, for co-hosting this event. Uh, once again, we're thrilled that everyone joined us today to launch the special issue on psychosocial support and social emotional learning. And this event provides a preview of the exciting content contained in that publication. Um, we'll hear brief presentations from our authors representing each of the articles, the research articles and the field notes featured there. Um, please visit the journal website and read their terrific articles in full. Um, and you can find links to the, their articles in the, in the chat. Um, and so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dana Birdie. Uh, JEIE's Editor-in-Chief. Dana Birdie is uh, the uh, Associate Professor and Director of International Education at NYU's Department of Applied Statistics, Social Science, and Humanities, and Associated Faculty at NYU's Center for Practice and Research at the Intersection of Information, Society, and Methodology. Her research has been funded by the Spencer Foundation, National Science Foundation, U.S. Institute of Peace, UK Department for International Development, Danita, and USAID. Um, and Dana, I'm very happy to turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much, Hetty. And thank you so much, Paul, for those wonderful words. It was really, um, really inspiring to listen to your comments. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to our official launch of the JEIE special issue on psychosocial support and social emotional learning. We are thrilled to be able to share this publication with you today. And we're excited that each paper has an author representing it here to give you a preview, as Hetty mentioned, of the important information you'll find in each article. I will briefly introduce the lead article, excuse me, the lead editors for this special issue and one of our funders for this issue. But first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the journal. Many of you know that the Journal on Education and Emergencies, many of you know a lot about the journal, but what you may not realize is that we maintain an entirely open access model of publication in order to work as a global public good. At the same time, we adhere to rigorous academic standards. This means that the contents of the journal are accessible and free for all readers everywhere. We do not charge fees for authors either. We don't limit access only to those authors who have the resources to raise funds to pay for their fees. Thus, we maintain a truly open access model of publishing and promoting equity in the field. In fact, we recently discovered um, that this, this model that we emulate is called the diamond open access model. We're very, very proud of this position that we take and these resources that we offer to people around the world under the mission of INEE. Of course, this is all linked to our parent organization, the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, without whom we would not be here today. Because this is a not-for-profit publishing model, none of this would be possible without our generous funders, the Porticus Foundation, the Lego Foundation, and the Open Society Foundation. As members of the Moving Minds Alliance, these three foundations have been true partners and supporters of the journal. As we endeavored, to keep working throughout the pandemic with small children at home. Did I mention that we're, we're women directed and women run and women managed, women led? Shout out to Jessica Yarand from Porticus who helped us stay sane during this period. I'd also like to note that JEIE has a new look. It's not just aesthetically pleasing, but the journal is now accessible to people with disabilities. Our Lego funding specifically made this change possible. We're very fortunate to have Paul Frisoli, one of our LEGO founders here with us today, and I'll briefly introduce Paul, then our lead editors who will speak in a minute. Paul Frisoli is a senior program specialist in the humanitarian team at the LEGO Foundation. His background includes designing, implementing, and researching education emergency programming with a strong focus on mental health, psychosocial support, and socio-emotional learning. Welcome, Paul. It's wonderful to see you here today, Paul. And for those who don't know Paul, he has a very long uh, history with INE, as well as with the topic of research on education emergencies. Our lead editors did an incredible job curating and guiding this special issue. And we are so deeply appreciative of this, of their work. It was a Herculean task. Jim Williams is professor and UNESCO chairholder at George Washington University. His teaching and research focus on policy and planning to improve education in low middle income contexts, focusing on children and young people in marginalized groups and conflict affected areas. Raghunil Divdal is a program director at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and an adjunct associate professor of global mental health at the Center for Crisis Psychology at the University of Bergen. She has worked with mental health and psychosocial support in emergencies and complex settings in many countries and roles for a number of years and was previously head of education and research at NORAD. Over to you, Jim and Raghunath. Thank you. Thank you, Dana, and uh, welcome everyone. It's so good to see uh, actual faces of the people we've been corresponding with. The uh, consequences of emergencies, including conflict, disasters, and forced migration, are severe, as we know, on individuals, society, and, and really the earth. Education is recognized as crucial in protecting children and societies from these consequences. Education provides normalcy buffering effects 
often in the form of psychosocial support, along with skills and knowledge taught, learned, uh, all connected through social and emotional learning, which is particularly important in the, con in the crisis context in which we work. Despite the importance of these issues, there is a lack of evidence on the many aspects of psychosocial support and social emotional learning. Special issue is intended to help build that knowledge base. We hope to contribute what we, to what we collectively know about psychosocial support, social emotional learning in emergencies and highlight some of the tools used to understand well-being, psychosocial support, effectiveness of programming and learning of the social and emotional side. The research in mental health and psychosocial support and social emotional learning in emergencies is global. It is often carried out in complex settings and it's usually very applied. And it's uh, very often carried out through cooperation between various agencies and partners. The importance of lived experience and the voices of people who actually live in emergencies is increasingly recognized. Many education in emergencies practitioners develop and implement programs while at the same time working with researchers to collect evidence on particular instruments and programs. These characteristics are also reflected in the special issue and in all the nine snapshots from this issue that you will um, be able to see and listen to shortly. The special issue contains six research articles three field notes, two book reviews, and one commentary. The authors who contributed to this issue work at more than 30 institutions based in more than 12 countries. People move around, so it's hard to keep track, but uh, that's our count. Assessment and measurement are at the center of the, of the current issue. Another issue, central issue is that of contextualization, putting the instruments and the programming into the cultural, social, and political contexts of the people we're working with. Resilience, coping, and well being are also important topics. And finally, the fact that education in emergencies is not only a question of students, but also younger children, parents, teachers, communities, and others is also reflected in this issue. It has, as Jim said, been a true pleasure and an honor to edit this issue but it's also been uh, um, hard work and difficult, partly because there, there were so many good pieces to uh, choose from, to go through, and we have learned a lot. And we have a tremendous respect for the people who live and practice and research under difficult circumstances and who generate knowledge. We have read uh, numerous great pieces, and we're sure that many of those that did not get included in this issue will still be published. We would like to take this opportunity to thank you, all authors, the reviewers and the staff at the journal, especially Dana Birdie and her team, notably Hedy Lemon, Nathan Thompson, Samantha Collin, Dana Pittman, Rukaya Saruk and Sneha Bolisetti, with whom we have worked very uh, closely. We know there are other people as well who work behind the scenes and we are grateful. Thank you all so much. Finally, we thank you all for your hard work, patience, grace, and dedication. We hope that the special issue will contribute to strengthening psychosocial support and social emotional learning in education and emergencies and be useful in promoting the rights of people, uh, children, especially in emergencies and the quality of services they receive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim and Roggenhold. I'll now invite Paul Frisoli uh, to make a few remarks on behalf of the sponsors for this special issue. Over to you, Paul. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much. And I know folks are really interested in diving in, so I will promise to be uh, brief. Um, I'm here wearing a Lego Foundation hat and a Moving Minds Alliance hat today. Um, at the Lego Foundation, we're committed to ensuring that children are creative, engaged, and lifelong learners. And we work with our partners to contextualize programs that further the evidence base and generate buy-in on the best way to support children's holistic development, including their social, emotional, cognitive, creative, and physical skills. 
Um, PSS and SEL interventions are important components of children's holistic development. And the evidence here that we're going to learn about today and that's in the issue is, is key to understanding the best ways to holistically support children and other stakeholders, including teachers in crisis contexts. Um, the Moving Minds Alliance, um, our vision is that families caught up in crisis are able to rebuild resilience and foster the well being and development of their young children. And the mission of the NMA is to scale up the financing policies and leadership needed to effectively support young children and families affected by crisis and displacement everywhere. And in 2019, when the Moving Minds Alliance uh, uh, funders group came together and a few of its other members, we agreed to co-fund this PSS SEL special issue, which aimed to ensure that rigorous scholarly and practitioner evidence can inform policy programming and future research. And we're really pleased to see this uh, issue come up. Um, on behalf of both the, the LEGO Foundation and the Movie Minds Alliance, we're very excited about the diversity of contexts and stakeholders and authors reflected in this issue. We're also very excited about the focus on expanding measurement and making measurement tools more contextually relevant, including tools from and that contribute to the INEE measurement library. If you haven't looked at the measurement library, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, there are so many tools that you can use that are very relevant um, and that we're looking to, at ways to um, add new tools to the, to the library as well. And we're also proud that this um, contribution from the foundation helped the journal uh, create a publication that adheres to global standards for visual web, web accessibility, allowing the journal to reach a wider range of people with disabilities. So really exciting things that are in this issue. Um, congratulations to the editors, congratulations to all the authors. Um, and thank you again. We hope you are just as excited as we are at the Foundation and the Moving Minds Alliance uh, about this webinar and the special issue. And I'll hand it back over to you, Hedy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, so really excited. We're about to, to hear from all of our presenters and authors today. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, we will be hearing from Nikit Desa, who is an assistant professor and senior associate director for research at the University of Notre Dame's Global Center for the Development of the Whole Child. He's currently in Washington, D.C. We'll then hear from Carly Tubbs Dolan, the deputy director at NYU Global Ties for Children. Currently in, NY, currently in New York. We'll hear from Moses Oyemi, a graduate research assistant at Purdue University, currently in Indiana. Fernanda Suarez, uh, we'll hear from uh, Fernanda, who's a technical advisor at FHI 360, currently in Washington, DC. Followed by Liliana Angelica Ponguta, a research faculty at Yale Child Study Center, currently in Connecticut. We'll hear from Raya Lina Punamaki, a psychologist and professor at Tampere University, currently in Finland. We'll then hear from Shana Cohn, the Director of International Education at Sesame Workshop, currently in New York, followed by Sergei Bogdanov, an Associated Professor in Psychology at the University of Kiev Mohila Academy, currently in Ukraine. And finally, we'll hear from Gloria Pedersen, a doctoral student and senior research associate at George Washington University, currently in Washington, DC. As you hear, we have a terrific and exciting lineup and, and quite a packed one, so I don't wanna spend any more time, um, except to remind our panelists that we will be keeping time. Joao, if you wouldn't mind putting your camera on again so our panelists can see your face. When you see uh, Joao appear, that is your cue. Leave your hand, Joao, there he is. Um, that you have about 20 seconds left and you need to wrap up your remarks so that we have plenty of time for all of our panelists to present. Um, thanks, Joao. And now I'll turn off my camera and turn it over to Nikit Desa to get us started. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, so back in 2015, when we were doing research in social emotional learning, we did a search for different types of social emotional learning measures that were out there specifically focused on primary school children. And what we found were hundreds of measures. But the challenge that we found was that a lot of these measures were focused on, on primarily high resource contexts, not an emergency context. 
they had strong copyrights or adaptation restrictions attached to them, sometimes subscription fees. Uh, and a lot of them used like set type measures and performance-based measures or, or vignettes that we thought were more appropriate for children in emergencies. And so what we ended up doing over a three-year period, we ended up designing the International Social Emotional Learning Assessment, uh, which uh, we'll be presenting on today. I'm presenting on behalf of myself and Alison Krupa, who is the co-author on this paper. And the research we present on is from one of the final validation studies we did in 2019 in Doho, Iraq, with 620 children. The measure itself is freely and easily accessible and available for anyone to use and adapt on INEE's uh, measurement library. And it measures five different skills for children, uh, social emotional skills for children. Um, so what we tried to understand was what was the validity and reliability for this measure when used with children in the whole era. Uh, and what we looked at was the construct validity. So we had a theory of how these different items that were measuring, for example, self-concept, actually measured it. And we wanted to validate that and see if that was actually true. And we found strong construct validity for all of the different uh, measures that we developed, except for perseverance, where we had some satisfactory evidence, but not really strong. We also looked at convergent and discriminant validity. We had a theory that, for example, children's score would increase with age, for which we found strong, strong support. But we also had a theory that, for example, children's scores would decrease with the number of adverse state experience. And we didn't find strong evidence for that, especially for, for self-concept and conflict resolution, but we did for stress management and empathy. We also looked at the internal consistency. So for example, if you think of eight items measuring self-concept, if a child scores low on one of those items, we'd expect them to score low on the others as well. And so consistency in, those, in that scoring. We found strong internal consistency for all of the items, once again, except for when we were measuring perseverance. And lastly, we looked at inter- Ability. One of the things about the Icella that we developed is that it's a performance and vignette based measure. So for conflict resolution, children are asked a question about, think about it, you're playing with a toy and another child wants to come and play with the same toy, uh, what do you do? And in each context where it's used, we develop appropriate and inappropriate response options that are suitable for that context. So it's, it's culturally and socially uh, and contextually appropriate. But assessors need to score children options. So we need to make sure that assessors are scoring children similarly across different children. And so we looked at interrater reliability and we found strong levels of agreement for interrater reliability. So overall, we think we have strong evidence for, for the, the validity and reliability for this measure when used with children in the Hukara, except for perseverance, of course. Uh, but specifically, when we focus on training assessors and spending about three days training assessors to know how to score the tool, as well as to, to do a mock day in a school for them to score it. And then also spending the time before we actually go and use this measure to make sure it's adapted appropriately. And for each of these items that we actually develop appropriate and inappropriate contextually relevant items that make meaning in the different contexts that this tool is used. Uh, so that's it for me and I'll hand it over to Carly. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Nikit. Um, and thanks, Sam. So um, our article presents evidence on teachers' observations of learners' social and emotional learning, or the tool cell. Um, tool cell is, well, a tool uh, that was assembled to meet a need for measures that can be used to evaluate the impact of social and emotional learning programming. To be able to use a measure uh, for program evaluation purposes, it must provide data that is consistent or reliable, credible or valid and fair. That is, there must be evidence that the measure is understood in the same way um, by different groups, such as by boys and girls or by children of different age groups. Toolcell was adapted from existing measures to capture a range of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral competencies that are hypothesized to be important for children's adaptation in classrooms, in classroom settings, in emergency contexts, and which are targeted by some common SEL programs in emergency contexts, such as the International Rescue Committee's Five Cs program or the Norwegian Refugee Council's Better Learning program. Toolcell relies on teachers' reports, which are based on teachers' accumulated knowledge and perceptions of a child in various social and academic situations over a period of time. 
Such reports are likely to be more representative of children's overall functioning than observation measures, and they're also less likely to be subject to social desirability bias or to children's self-awareness than self-report survey measures. We tested ToolCell in the context of an impact evaluation of the International Rescue Committee's 5Cs SEL program provided to Syrian refugee children in non-formal remedial programming in Lebanon. This allowed us to generate evidence that ToolCell captures four competencies in this specific context, pro-social behavior and academic engagement, social challenges, working memory functioning, and emotion and behavioral regulation. We generated evidence that the information from ToolCell is reliable or internally consistent, as Nikit was explaining. Um, and uh, we also gener generated evidence that scores can be compared without bias across gender, gender, age, time, and program type. Because we were able to generate evidence of the fairness of the scores, we were able to responsibly generate evidence on, for example, gender differences and teachers' perceptions of children's social and emotional skills. So in this graph, you see, for example, that girls were rated significantly higher than boys on all of the positive competencies and lower on social challenges. We also found evidence that tool cell scores are associated as expected with other measures of social and emotional skills and with contextual factors providing evidence of convergent validity. Um, so just to move now to say, how do we recommend using tool cell? First and foremost, also you heard from Nikit, always pilot, adapt, and test when using a new context and with new populations. Second, we recommend using this measure in contexts in which there are small to medium class sizes to ensure that teachers really know the children well um, and also to reduce teacher burden. In this paper, we also describe other strategies to reduce teacher burden and to promote observation quality. Um, we will be submitting tool cell to the IME Measurement Library, which is a collaboration between NYU's Global Ties for Children, the IRC, and INEE. Um, and uh, we are excited, we encourage everyone that when they select a measure from the library um, to please then submit back the evidence uh, of how the measure is working when you've adapted it. Um, and also to submit new tools as we're really hoping to grow the library um, into a community of practice. So I will stop there um, and turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Carly. Uh, next, we will hear from Moses Olayemi. Over to you, Moses. Uh, thank you all and welcome from beautiful, snowy Indiana. Uh, the context of our study centered around South Sudan, the world's newest nation. Incidents of violence and war have caused an extremely high level of displacement of South Sudanese children and youth, both within and outside its geographic boundaries, leaving significant impacts on the psychological and emotional states of the populace. Since 2015, more than 560,000 South Sudanese children have received prime, um, psychosocial support through the Integrated Essential Emergency Education Services Program, a USAID-funded project implemented by UNICEF. This paper is an offshoot of a much broader goal to evaluate the impact of this evaluation of this intervention on students' psychosocial well-being and academic performance. Our research team consisted of this much smaller subset of a large multi-institutional consortium of multidisciplinary partners. Our approach was to use a two-stage sampling procedure of recruiting 2,982 students, 580 teachers in 64 schools that were sampled from five states in the Republic of South Sudan. Our research team quickly realized through our desk reviews how crucial it was to create a culturally and contextually relevant and rigorously validated instrument to measure students' well-being in a region like South Sudan where research on PSS outcomes in education emergencies is needed. This article chronicles the process by which we developed that instrument, including the collaborative efforts of experts on measuring PSS outcomes in conflict settings and experts on the local South Sudan context. Our work shows the result of our test for the construct validity of the resulting instruments and the results of our confirmatory factor analysis of this three-factor model of social well-being, emotional well-being, and resilience and coping. 
The questionnaires we based our instrument on are previously, previously been used extensively in different sociopolitical and cultural contexts. Our contextualization and validation protests, uh, process for this context was rigorous. Overall, we find that the three core domains we measured, emotional well-being, social well-being, and resilience and coping emerged as factors in the South Sudanese context. The domain of resilience in particular is identified as a significant self-regulation factor in South Sudan. We recommend that the academic and practitioner communities use it as and when appropriate to assess well-being outcomes in South Sudan or similar contexts. Another equally important recommendation is the process through which we adapted, implemented, and reassessed the instruments we use to measure well-being outcomes. From the beginning of the process, local South Sudanese researchers prioritize domains of interest and modify the questions as appropriate. We strongly recommend that this level of collaboration and local leadership be a core facet of any work on psychosocial support and more broadly on the study of education in conflict settings. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Uh, I will now turn it over to Fernanda Suarez. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How do we know if teachers in crisis and conflict affected settings are well? With this question in mind, my co-authors Nina Cunha, Paul Frisoli, and I embarked on a journey to first understand what teacher well-being means, specifically in the context of El Salvador, and to develop the well-being holistic assessment tool for teachers, or the WHAT tool. Our tool measures four key constructs of teacher well-being burnout, stress, emotion regulation, and self-efficacy. Given the stressors that educators constantly face in El Salvador related to the influence of gang violence in their day-to-day -day work, and the potential for these stressors to lead to negative outcomes of well-being, we prioritize the measurement of stress and burnout in the WOT tool, and specifically the emotional exhaustion dimension of burnout. However, we also wanted to go beyond affective aspects of well-being to consider protective factors that may influence how a teacher responds to different stressors. So we included emotion regulation based on the hypothesis that teachers with better emotion regulation strategies may be better equipped to deal with the emotional demands of their work that tend to increase their stress levels. Self-efficacy and specifically self-efficacy for classroom management was also included in our tool. Teachers that perceive lower ability to manage students' behaviors when facing discipline issues could potentially be more susceptible to feeling stressed and anxious, which may also lead to emotional exhaustion. For each of these four constructs, we developed a measurement inventory, and then we selected individual measures to be further refined and adapted specifically for the context of El Salvador. We selected pre-existing scales with good internal consistency, scales that were short, that were easy to comprehend, and preferably they were, they were unidimensional to simplify the analysis process. We then tested and validated our tool with a sample of over 1,600 teachers in El Salvador. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what are some of the key characteristics of the WOT tool? First, the tool is relevant to the context and realities of teachers in El Salvador. The choice of constructs was based on the experiences of teachers in the country, and the tool was locally adapted through cognitive interviews with a sample of 25 Salvadorian teachers. Second, the tool is feasible to be implemented. Given the resource, logistics, and time constraints that we all know policymakers and practitioners working in conflict-affected settings face, we kept feasibility at the forefront of our tool development process. Specifically, the final WOT tool is short, it's easy to comprehend, can be self-administered by teachers and hence require minimum assessor training and can be implemented at a low cost. And finally, the WAT tool has demonstrated strong psychometric properties around reliability and validity. Our findings support the internal consistency reliability of the individual measures included in the tool. The cognitive interviews provided validity evidence based on the contents of the items. Exploratory factor analysis verified the structure of the individual measures, and our confirmatory factor analysis confirmed the good model fit. 
And finally, the intercorrelation among the measures in the tool, as well as with other external measures that we included for validation purposes, were in the expected direction, which provides validity evidence based on relations to other variables. I invite you to read uh, our manuscript for more details on the tool development process, on the tool psychometric process, as well as on potential uses of the tool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, next, we'll hear from Liliana Angelica Ponguta. Over to you, Liliana. Hi, good morning. Um, it's a real honor to be here um, in representation of our team and um, share with you the results of a pragmatic evaluation of the three C's program for caregivers of young children affected in the armed conflict in Colombia. Um, so three C's stands for Contigo, Conmigo, Con Todos, which in English translates to with you, with myself, and with everyone. Um, it is an intervention or a program that was designed by a team at La Fundación Saldarrega Concha, which is an organization based in Bogota, but that works broadly in the entire country of Colombia. Um, in essence, it is a program that um, addresses issues around, in particular, reconciliation and resilience promotion. And it targets or addresses, in particular, caregivers of young children who are enrolled in early childhood development centers in the country. Um, so what did we do? Um, well, we developed this program, implemented it, and pragmatically evaluated it. Um, we did this um, for many reasons, but two of the ones I want to highlight today is um, we know that ecological programs, in other words, those that address not only the child and, and the educator, but also what happens in the larger family and community context are, are really sparse or, or they're sorely lacking. Um, we also know that resilience building interventions, which is a really critical issue of psychosocial support and social emotional development, are also sparse. So the intervention or the program itself um, has two modules. It has a skills building program, um, which targets or is open to all grandparents, uh, parents and educators of the young children, which we call caregivers as a whole. Um, but it also has a second arm, which is a psychotherapy intervention. And this was offered uh, to parents who self-reported to be victims of the armed conflict, but who also screened negative for depression, PTSD and or anxiety. And this is because there's a recognition that in the presence of psychopathologies, these caregivers would need specialized um, attention. And whereas this is a community-based intervention, it really is not um, you know, a, a, a clinical intervention per se. So this was implemented in 14 municipalities that have been acutely impacted by the armed conflict and in forced displacement in Colombia. Um, it was implemented, um, of course, under the leadership of Fundación Saldarrega Concha, but in very close partnership with the Colombian government, in particular, the, the Colombian Institute of Child Welfare and the Ministry of uh, uh, the Commission on Early Childhood, as well as national and international universities. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Um, so what did we find? Um, two key findings I want to highlight. Uh, we found that uh, victims of the armed conflict in Colombia, this population, were willing to participate in a program that explicitly promoted resilience. In our pragmatic evaluation, we also were able to show stati statistically significant improvements in CD risk, which is a self-report measure of uh, resilience. And there's a manuscript on its uh, psychometric evaluation forthcoming in both intervention arms. Um, despite these findings, though, there's a lot that we still need to know. We need to know if the changes in resilience were sustained over time. Importantly, we need to understand how changes in resilience in these caregivers impact their behavior, their well-being, and other outcomes among the different kinds and types of caregivers. We also need to understand what are the impacts of caregiver participation, particularly in the outcomes of children. So what's the transference of this mobilization of um, resilience into child outcomes? Uh, we do think there's very important implications of our work. Again, two I want to highlight today. This is one of the emergent pieces of evidence that we hope continue to inform programs and policies in the context of education and emergencies. And we also think this is a really good case study, an example of the importance of working across disciplines, across sectors, particularly when it comes to early childhood education emergencies in the context of psychosocial support, social emotional development in early childhood. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Angelica. I will now uh, turn it over to our next presenter, Rayalina Punamaki.
Uh, Raya, I think, Raya Lynn, I think you might be on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you there very you much for thank you very much for invitation. I'm uh, presenting uh, uh, our results concerning uh, intervention and research project we did in with our uh, Palestinian colleagues in the institutional context of Gaza Community Mental Health Program, and we were especially interested about how the uh, family relations, the content and the nature of family family. Uh, relations might uh, might influence the success of our uh, intervention, and the intervention was psychosocial school-based uh, in intervention, uh, especially uh, uh, focused and targeted of, or, or for uh, children exposed to traumatic war experiences, and this in this case in the in the context of Palestinian and Israeli conflict. And we were especially inspired by, um, by uh, uh, the family system theories in that way that we wanted to, uh, to identify different family types that would differ in their attachment relationships, in sibling relationships, and in parenting uh, styles and see how they affect our success in the intervention. And the second, second inspiration by the family system theories was that we were interested if our intervention could be uh, somehow having like a compensatory uh, dynamics or buffering dynamics in that way that, uh, that not only children who have lots of different uh, resources in families and communities, would still benefit from the intervention. And the success or, or effectiveness criteria for the in intervention was decrease of uh, uh, mental health symptoms, emotional and contact, uh, conduct uh, disorder uh, symptoms, and increase in social, psychosocial resources and uh, prosocial behavior. And here is, uh, you see, the setting what we had, and now thank you for the next slide already, because here I will present you on uh, uh, the main findings concerning the role of family relationships in decrease of emotional problems, that means anxiety and depression programs, uh, problems. And first of all, we identified four different family types according to the security and sibling relations, parent relations in the families. You have here the uh, secure and positive relation family types. They were like third of in our uh, research uh, data. And then you have insecurity and very negative, even harsh uh, relationships in the families. They share was uh, like 16% in our data and also kind of uh, uh, negative family relationships, uh, meaning that the family members, there was, uh, I mean, uh, the fathers, mothers, and uh, one target child reporting that they were really living kind in a different realities. They perceived the relations very differently. And then you have the moderate security and neutral uh, relationships, family type, somehow between the secure and the very insecure families. And we found here in this uh, uh, picture, two family systems uh, the dynamics. First of all, we see that um, uh, children from the very insecure and negative relationship families, their, their, their intervention was effective in decreasing their uh, emotional problems and also in in this other ne so called negative family type we were they were successful in decreasing the symptoms during the intervention but here we see that it didn't it it didn't carry on for the sustainability so they they increased again and then here the family the children who come from the very secure family, positive family relations types with resources, we can see that the 
they are buffered already at the beginning of uh, intervention. So here we see already that the emotional problems are very high in those uh, family, insecure families, although the compensation dynamics can be seen that the, the intervention was successful in decreasing them. But here you, we can see kind of buffering dynamics in that, that families, uh, children from the very secure families were well off already when they entered to our intervention. Just shortly uh, commenting and co concluding these find findings, we would very much uh, uh, argue that the multi-level, maybe also attachment theory and family systems theories informed knowledge about the families, their uh, vulnerabilities and also their strengths would be very useful when we plan targeted and tailored and evidence-based intervention for children who are exposed to extreme uh, traumatic war experiences. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Rayalina. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to Shana Kohn. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, J-E-I-E-N-I-N-E-E -E 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 for having us. Um, and I also want to do a quick thank you to my co-authors, Kim Folds, Charlotte Cole, Mackenzie Matthews, and Leila Hussein, who all con contributed to our field notes. Um, I'm going to speak about Sesame Street's local adaptation of, of the show for the Middle East and how we use a, a very research-based and participatory process to arrive at the educational goals for the show. So for those of you who are not familiar, Athlon Simpson is a local Sesame Street created for children and families affected by displacement. And like with all Sesame co-productions, we use this research-based process that you see on this slide um, in order to determine the focus of the show. Um, so at, at the very top of that slide, you see the needs assessment is our first step in our process. And in this case, the needs assessment helped us determine this focus on social emotional learning as a priority for the region. Um, our, my colleague Kim Fold is here to speak more about the research side of, uh, as we get to questions, but essentially we speak with caregivers and practitioners and people who are working with children in the region to really understand what the priorities are. So we went in knowing that that was, that was our goal but it was really our educational content seminar and later formative research that helped us refine that goal, working directly with local stakeholders to understand what aspects of social emotional learning would be most important for the region. Um, and when we came in with this idea, sort of a broad idea of conflict resolution and resilience, we were very quickly told by local experts that we'd be doing a disservice to children if we didn't focus on emotion identification and self-regulation as the building blocks for social emotional learning. So in many ways, this is essential to the Sesame approach. It's sort of the, the spirit of Sesame from the beginning is to start with the ABCs or the foundational blocks and then build on that. And we did exactly that with social emotional learning, um, working very closely with a team of amazing therapists and um, uh, local advisors. So next slide, please. Um, this is not the same as watching the show, but it will give you a taste of what the characters and set came to look like. All of this was created um, to support that specific goal of emotion identification. So Basma and Jad, the purple and yellow Muppets in the middle are almost six years old. And they are, um, they're both learning how to deal with big emotions and they practice things like belly breathing and drawing it out and moving it out to deal with those feelings. And then Tetanur and Hadi on the side, you can see our, our sort of adult caregiver figures. They're modeling for adults who are watching the show, empathetic communication and a, a appropriate and healthy emotional response to children sharing of emotions. Um, so all of these decisions were made with careful consideration and with conversations and experts on the ground, and including um, experts on trauma. Um, Jod, for example, uh, models sensory modes of expression. So it's not all verbal communication, which we heard was important for children who've experienced trauma. Um, and we really believe that our approach would not be nearly as impactful without that really participatory um, approach to creating the, the production. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shana. Uh, and our next speaker is Sergei Bogdanov.
over to you. Uh, hello, colleagues, <clears throat> and thank you uh, for this possibility. I, I speak today about the, the paper developing a culturally relevant measure of resilience for war affected adolescents in Eastern Ukraine. The I, aim of the paper was to describe uh, the development and psychometric properties of the first measure of resilience for war affected adolescents in Eastern Ukraine. So why we have done it? Because so first of all, there are a huge amount of children who are living in uh, conflict affected countries and Ukraine since 2040 is one of such countries where more than 400,000 children are uh, conflict affected. And as Jim uh, stated at the beginning, the validated for resiliency measure, especially resiliency for the program implementation purposes, especially in emergency setting, like in Ukraine, are highly required and lacking. And then since 2040, if we started our work, they were only a few measures that uh, were available and were mostly translated from Western develop, in developed in Western countries. So the our idea was con contextualization as a look for the measure that will really that will be less biased and show uh, culturally silent silent assets of resilience construct in Ukraine. Uh, what we done? Uh, we have uh, as a, we used mixed method approach. Uh, qualitative and quantitative methods. First of all, to identify main cultural characteristic of resilience and this conflict specifically for Eastern Ukraine. And that should inform our validation study when we wanted to statistically test this local model of resilience. You can see here also the colleagues that I'm very pleased to uh, introduce here and that we work on this paper. There is a team of practitioners, practitioners and pedagogists, psychologists from Ukraine and globally. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so it, our work resulted in the resilience screener for use uh, that, uh, as I said, we started with doing 76 uh, semi-structured in-depth interview with young adolescents who lived in the front line. And additionally, 10 focus group were conducted with another people just to uh, look at the construct that we are extracted from uh, the semi-structured interview. And we wanted to see if how the children explained it and really learn entire perspective. Uh, based on the results, we have, uh, as we've done a bottom-up approach and use um, inductive method to develop categories or uh, that would mostly represent the resilience construct in Ukraine. You can see it uh, uh, here in the slides. We have identified 12 such categories that also includes uh, uh, both also some coping strategies, uh, not only positive, but also negative, like conflicting with other or social isolation. Uh, based on this, we... Um, developed uh, initial questionnaires with 146 items. And uh, using exploratory structural equation model uh, procedure with, uh, within a sample of 218 adolescents, we were able to extract five factors model with 27 variables. And you can see that these five factors are family support, optimism, persistence, health, and social networking. So this uh, measure has a good internal consistency, as you can see, a good test for test reliability. But then we also conducted unconfirmatory factor analysis because we wanted to look what are the relationships between all these five factors and to test, would we identify that there are only one single uh, general factors that unify all of them, or we will see some sub factors and the results show that the bifactorial model uh, fits the best, uh, that namely only family support, most, only one most significant factor that we were able to identify. And the rest of this four rather built a general resilience factor that mostly fits with the Mustang ideas and the interplay between resiliency and uh, family support. 
And we think it's not unique, but interesting because the family is only one uh, significant relational and contextual factors that the children and adolescents are relying on. And compared to other models, this Ukrainian one also characterized through absence of community support or spirituality support that those factors were identified in other conflict affected context. So we think that the measure we have created is practically uh, so it's useful, it's short, has only 27 variables. It's describe a local perspective of children and resiliency and could be helpful in measurement of the effectiveness of psychosocial programs, as well as uh, in further exploration and the resilience and their interplay between stress, resiliency, and learning or mental health outcome. Thank you very much. And turning back to Heidi. Thank you, Sergey. And now we'll hear from our final presenter, Gloria Pedersen. Over to you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much to my fellow co-authors and JEIE for this successful publication and exciting panel. In humanitarian settings, mental health and psychosocial support services are often delivered in group-based formats. And there's increasing evidence that these services can be effectively delivered by trained and supervised non-specialists, such as teachers or community health workers. Facilitators of group-based programs use a set of skills that differ from those in individual services, such as effective time and turn-taking skills to avoid one or more group members dominating a session. A minimum competency standard can help ensure that group facilitators achieve their needed skills to deliver MHPSS successfully and identify and address potentially harmful behaviors prior to real world delivery. However, there's a lack of tools for assessing these competencies. And in this study, we made it our objective to develop such a tool. We reviewed MHSP MHPSS manuals and tools to identify key group facilitation skills and develop items. The items were reviewed by an expert field team in Nepal involved in developing and adapting individual-based MHPSS interventions to be group-based. The final eight items were then formatted to create Group Act, a structured tool for assessing competencies through observation, such as with standardized role plays using mock group members or during real-world delivery of group sessions. Next slide. We conclude our article with guidance for using the tool including use of group acts on the Ensuring Quality and Psychological Support Platform. Developed by the World Health Organization in partnership with UNICEF, EQUIP aims to enhance the consistency and quality of training, supervision, and service delivery worldwide. The platform offers a range of easy to use digital competency assessment tools alongside group act, including for foundational helping skills when working with adults or when working with children and adolescents, and intervention specific skills like problem management techniques. EQUIP also offers a range of e-learning courses and other resources to promote scaling up of competency-driven training with flexible use in any area, such as with training of trainers or training of facilitators and during supervision or pre-service. EQUIP is funded by USAID and will be a global public good. An open access public launch is anticipated for early spring this year. Thanks so much for your time, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much to our terrific presenters for sharing uh, the incredible evidence that's contained in your articles in a very concise and brief way um, to give us a teaser of what's contained in the publication. Um, so I'll ask Sam again to, to please post the, the link to the publication so everyone has access, check out their articles in full. Um, we now, um, because our presenters were so uh, fantastic in keeping to time, we have a, a, some, a nice amount of time for Q&A. Um, so I'll invite folks to please share your questions using the Q&A function. Um, there are a few questions that are relevant across panelists. Um, so because these questions um, kind of speak to everyone in broader uh, ideas related to PSSSEL, I'm going to share all three of them and ask that, you know, the panelists respond to the question that's most relevant to their work and um, uh, the research that they've been conducting. 
Uh, and I'll also post these in the chat so we have them for reference. So let me do that now. So starting with this one, and then I'll, I'll share two more. And again, panelists can think which, which, which question they'd like to respond to. So first question coming from one of our participants. I recently participated in the Better Learning Program workshop by NRC in Iran. From what I have understood, the concept of education and emergencies and psychosocial support are mostly focused on education and ongoing crises like conflicts and disasters or forced migration. But there are thousands of Afghan children who actually were born here in Iran and have not experienced firsthand conflicts or fleeing, their parents or grandparents had to flee Afghanistan years ago, and they are still suffering the consequences. The ongoing crisis for them is dealing with poverty and discrimination in the host community. And here's the question. I wonder if this kind of situation could be addressed in the concept of PSS and SEL in the humanitarian sector. Um, the next question I will share. I'll post it here. What is an intervention that shows effectiveness in addressing conduct disorders? And what kind of tools and approaches might an intervention like that include? And finally, one more broad question, and then I'll turn it over to our panelists to start responding. What is global good practice in the areas of SEL, PSS? This is the expert panel to ask this question to. And what is the difference? So now I'll invite any one of our panelists to grab one of these questions and share your thoughts. I mean, I could take a crack at the first question um, because it's, it's really interesting. Hi, um, I don't know the person that um, sends that um, question, but I, I think it's a very relevant question in the sense that when we talk about like displacements, um, when we talk about displacements, um, displacement can either be internal or external. Um, in the context of the study that we wrote our paper um, around, that was a context where the displacement that the populace experienced was internal. Um, but I think you're talking about one that is external, for instance, and my research lab also does work in refugee contexts, will provide access to engineering education in refugee contexts uh, for refugees in um, Azraq, Jordan, um, and also in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And even in this context, the relevance of um, psychosocial supports um, keeps rearing its head. Uh, because it's not just providing access to education, for instance, we notice when we carry out our interventions or our education interventions, that students are dealing with the ramifications of the violence that they experienced in their home countries. And those violence, those ramifications have not automatically dissipated just because they're in a different community. Um, so we are consciously bringing in, um, even in the deployment of our education services, uh, recognition of the trauma um, that um, our students, the population have experienced. And this has to be very well interwoven into the intervention. So I don't know if that directly answers your question, but I just want to give credence to it and say yes, absolutely. Um, not just in internally displaced context, but also in external displaced context, there's relevance for PSS and SEL. Um, I hope that answers your question. And I forget the name of the person who asked it originally, but that would be my approach to answering it. I'll try to get the name of that person and put it in the chat. I'll now uh, go to Roggenhild and then Sergey. Thank you. I'd also like to add just another um, comment to that good question in that what is a crisis or an emergency in one setting may not be one or at least the same one in another. And so that it has a lot to do with the resources as well and how they're used. So uh, in a way you could say, if you think of crises and emergencies as when the needs exceed the resources, then it, um, it doesn't have to be an ongoing conflict, for example. Uh, and we found that some of the uh, interventions that were developed to be used in emergencies in very, uh, complex uh, emergencies with uh, low uh, resources 
have been found to be useful in high income settings as well, because uh, the resources sometimes are not sufficient for the needs. Uh, for example, uh, the some interventions to, uh, to support uh, children uh, using uh, very scalable, simple manuals that were only designed really to be used in, in low-income uh, countries have been used in Scandinavia, where one should imagine that there would be plenty of, uh, of resources, for example, for uh, uh, asylum-seeking families and found to be useful. So I think that perspective as well, that it's not an accurate science in that sense is, is, is useful and that what is a crisis and an emergency can also vary somewhat. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I can try to answer this question and what is an intervention that shows effectiveness for addressing conduct disorders. Uh, I will maybe not speak about the disorders, but rather the conduct problems, because we use, as we have developed in Ukraine and tested uh, intervention, group intervention provided by school psychologists within school setting and outside, that is using strengths and difficulties questionnaires. We sh it showed a good effectiveness and resolving conduct problems and other types of problems uh, measured with uh, as, as the Q. And, this intervention is mostly based on cognitive behavior therapy approaches like stress management, social engagement, uh, reestablishing social contacts, working with difficult memories, uh, think as so well like thinking in diff cognitive restructuring or thinking in different way. And I think there is a global evidence that uh, that work mostly for the people who are in conflict affected settings, so at least in Ukraine, that works well, and we have tested it within school and outside of school. And yeah, that is our experience we can share. Thank you, Sergey. I, I saw there was a hand up, um, Deborah Haynes. I'm not entirely sure how this how this works in terms of, of uh, inviting you to speak. Sarah might have to help me with this in terms of the webinar Zoom logistics. Uh, go ahead, Deborah. Uh, Sarah, is Deborah able to unmute herself? She is. I'm not sure she actually has a question though, so I'll I'll write her. Oh, okay. Maybe it's not. Sorry, that was was actually an error. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. I see. There's a. Uh, it looks like there's another hand up. Sure. I'm I'm happy to jump in and, and try and answer uh, parts of questions one and three, also. Um, and I I think for question one, I think. Um, so a, a lot of research has shown that sort of one of the most important predictors of children's well-being um, in, in emergency context, in context of displacement, is the risks that they are face, that they face post-migration. And so what is most predictive um, are those daily stressors. Um, that I think the question person who asked question one um, is referring to. And so um, there's, uh, I think, an article by some of my colleagues in the Journal of Applied Developmental Psychology that looks at that. And I do think that ESS and SEL programs um, can, are very relevant uh, in that context that you're, that you're talking about. To answer a little bit about question three and the distinction between PSS and SEL, um, so as, as far as I think about it and understand it, PSS is sort of thinking about prevention. And so after a trauma and adversity, a shock has occurred, how do you prevent um, mental health or, or other difficulties? And social and emotional learning, I think of it more as promotion. So how do you promote these skills, these social and emotional skills proactively um, to support adaptation? Um, in terms of best practices, global best, best practices. I mean, I think one of the common themes that I really heard across all of the presenters and highlighted in the introduction was this focus on um, adaptation and contextualization. Um, and I think to, along those lines, I mean, what, you're, what we were sort of hearing in the measures and the programs are underlying that, what are the core frameworks and the competencies and the skills that are most important in these contexts and spending the time to invest in those systems and understand, collect information 
um, uh, incorporate the voices of the people in the context so that as you're developing these tools and these programs, they're meaningful and relevant. Um, and so that's what I would sort of say as an emerging global best, best practice. Terrific, thank you, Carly. And I'll ask if there's um, any other authors or panelists or, or editors who'd like to respond to any of those questions. We've got a couple more questions coming in. Uh, Nikit, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Hedy, thanks. I'll, I'll jump in here as well. Just to add to, to Carly's uh, two points, uh, and there is, a, there is a white paper on the IMG website about uh, PSS SEL and the link between those. Uh, my internet connection is not unfortunately good enough for me to research that and post the link. So if someone can post the link to that, uh, and, or after I speak, I'll, I'll post the link in the chat. But taking a look at that, and the, the, there is a pretty well-described link between PSS and SEL. Uh, I think to relate to that last question, but also the, the first one, uh, and to kind of piggyback of what Carly was saying, I think with, with SEL programming or, or kind of in developmental psychology, we think of kind of the risk factors that children face. Um, and programs or factors that directly address those those risk factors would be considered uh, protective for children, right? So, so something like a program that directly affects a specific risk factor for children would be considered protective, while a program that that has a benefit for children in almost all contexts, independent, which is which is hard to say, independent of the risk factor, would be con considered promotive. And so, I think in some some senses, SEL programming serves both those roles, right? So if we take the example that, that the individual was talking about in, in Iran with, with children living who have been born uh, in, in Iran but have parents who have, who have come from, who have been forcefully displaced in Afghanistan, uh, there is a factor of both promotion and, and prevention for those children with SEL programs. And that's, I think, partly the, the article that, that Carly was referring to as well. And so I think the, the 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 dichotomy between kind of crisis and non-crisis is not one that I think most of us or definitely not I can 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 define. But I do think that thinking about SEL programs uh, as being something that can be even in a classroom or in a broader setting be promoted for some children and preventative for others is a helpful way to sometimes think about it helping all children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikit. Um, the next question uh, I'm going to share is, is directly for Fernanda, and then I'll pose two more questions that are broad to the panelists, and I'll post those, post those in the chat. So uh, for Fernanda Suarez, for the teacher well-being tool in El Salvador, can you elaborate again on how the tool was used to inform the design of your teacher support package, routine monitoring, and to evaluate the impact of a teacher intervention. And then I'm gonna share these other two questions to all the panelists so you have time to think about them while, while uh, Fernanda is responding. And these two questions are here in the chat. Now, were children and adolescents with disabilities included in design and validation of any of these tools or programs? And then uh, one more question, were, um, was there no access in terms of technology as well as language the language translation barrier in order to garner um, correspondence regarding SEL at the community level. So what are the best practices in terms of uh, language translation barriers and technology? Um, and I will turn it over to Fernanda to kick us sure. off with some of Thank these responses. You. So uh, in response to the question, the what tool was developed in the context of a teacher well-being intervention in El Salvador. So we implemented the baseline, which I presented the information on across 60, over 1,600 teachers that comprise the treatment and a control group uh, in six different departments in El Salvador. Right before they started in a teacher well-being intervention, there was part of a larger teacher professional development program. So the teacher well-being intervention specifically was an intervention that uh, FHI 360 in coordination with the Minister of Education in El Salvador delivered to um, de delivered across eight different modules spread out in a little bit over one year. Uh, each module comprised of one or two days of intervention that really focused on 
the well-being and the development of social emotional competencies for the teacher under the recognition that in the literature and the evidence existing in the literature of the importance of teachers being well to develop and uh, promote social emotional competencies in the classroom among their students. So the intervention, like for example, focused on supporting teachers in, uh, in, in applying mindfulness techniques, uh, local stress management, uh, local stress management strategies, as well as, as I was mentioning, in developing their own social emotional competencies, and specifically around the, the castle framework of the five key social emotional competencies. So the tool was used, so going back to the tool then, so the tool was used to assess, uh, to assess a stress, emotional exhaustion, emotional regulation, and self-efficacy at baseline right before the teacher is engaged in this intervention package. And then we use the tool again to measure to see if there was any increase in teachers, uh, in teachers' well-being at the end line. And we compare the differences that we saw uh, between treatment and control groups. So what we present uh, in this manuscript specifically focuses again on the tool development process as well as on the psychometric properties of the tool. But you can stay tuned for also like another uh, paper that focuses specifically on the on the impacts of the intervention on the levels of teacher well-being in El Salvador. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Um, responses from our other panelists to the other questions that were posed. And there are some responses happening in the in the chat feature as well. I, I can speak to the the question on translation. I think I, I understood it, uh, but I think it's 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 asking specifically on on issues with translation of of measures. Maybe I, I think so. Uh, one thing that I'll mention so. Uh, the the tool that we tested out the Excel we tested out in the hook with specifically with Syrian refugee children who were who were forcibly displaced to the hook Iraq um, and the language that the children spoke uh, at home was Syrian Kurdish uh, which as we started doing this work we we found that it was a very well spoken language by the children and the community members and and even the teachers but it wasn't often written down so children didn't often see the script even the assessors that we were working with didn't often see the script. And so the way the Isella is administered is the assessor reads the, the, the question to the child in the language the child is most comfortable with. Uh, but since assessors couldn't always read Syrian Kurdish comfortably, we had to have the, the assessment translated into modern standard Arabic. And then our training of assessors focused a lot on them coming up with, with uh, well-articulated ways of remembering how to ask that question in Syrian Kurdish to the children. And so partly, I think one of the, the challenges, but also the, the things to remember in terms of best practices with translation and adaptation is the amount of time it takes for training. Uh, the number of times someone has asked me, can I train uh, assessors to use the Excel in half a day? Uh, and I unfortunately have to say no. Uh, it takes about three days to do that training at, at the least, with at least some time to go to a school and, and try it out and test it out. So I think when we're thinking of kind of translation, there's also the issue of administration with, with translation that, that can come up. Uh, and, it's, and I think one of the best practices that I would suggest, and I think a lot of the, the, the co-presenters would agree, is investing a lot in terms of adaptation and training of assessors to make sure that they, they know how to administer the tool. Thanks, Nikit. And, and uh, unless anyone else would like to speak to that question, I would like to pose the question again um, about children and adolescents with disabilities. If, if, if there was uh, the possibility of including um, children with disabilities in the design or validation of any of these tools or programs, or, or if not, that's also in, important and interesting to know. I'll go ahead, Carly. Um, I think maybe Raija, uh, she hasn't had the chance to respond yet. Okay, I know I'd, I, I, I don't have an answer directly to that from my own experiences with the teaching recovery techniques, but my Palestinian colleague, uh, Safar Diab is studying, was studying the, how blind children 
experience the in this case the war, uh, traumatic war, war experiences and also how blind children could be joined with the interventions but other informations i don't have at this moment uh, angelica and then kim and then carly Hi. Yeah, I mean, yes. Hi. I just, um, as I work with Shauna on Aachen Simpson and lead the research, as she mentioned, um, we really struggled to recruit families uh, and children with disabilities as part of our formative research process and in our needs assessments. Um, we've since tested some content that is representative of inclusion of, of children with disabilities, particularly there's a segment in every episode of Aachen that teaches a word of the day through sign language, and that's one of the most popular episodes, but one of the reasons that it's popular is not because necessarily it's around inclusion because children don't actually know what children are doing with their hands. So that's been an important lesson in terms of setting the context because we're hearing from parents, we don't have children with disabilities in our community. So it's important for our children to be exposed to it, which of course we know is not true. But I think going back to my previous point is one of the reasons why we have really struggled um, to recruit families um, with children with disabilities to be part of our sample is something that we are trying to be better about and more mindful of as we continue to create content, um, but we have not been successful at it so far. Full transparency in, in that. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Angelica, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And I might just kind of follow up on what Kim said, and it's sort of, um, one of the, uh, I think, strengths of the Colombian approach in terms of policy is the issue of equity as not as an add-on, right, of a policy or an intervention, but as part of, you know, kind of the makeup of that policy and that intervention. And I think what I mean by this is this call to look at the whole child, right, to look at the ecological context with the presence of disability, whatever sort of geopolitical context, whatever, you know, ethnic gender, right? It's, it's all part of, again, this call to program, you know, ecologically. And that includes looking at the caregiver, the community of care. And I really truly think this is particularly critical in psychosocial support and social emotional development. Um, so I think that in this approach of the three C's, for example, um, looks at that interaction with the caregiver understanding that no matter what the level of, you know, challenges of a child from a cognitive or developmental or, you know, again, geopolitical contextual perspective is really intrinsically linked with who that caregiver is. And so that more is just of a call to remind us as, as, as advocates, as researchers, as practitioners um, of the importance of looking at this in a more integrative way from a policy, from a research and from a, from a practice, practice perspective. Thank you, Angelica. Carly, did you want to share as well? Sure. Um, I think just, just following up on, on Angelica's point to share a little bit about two new projects that, that we've just started working on um, that will hopefully um, generate uh, test measures um, that are specifically uh, meant for working with children with disabilities and for the caregivers and teachers um, it, who are supporting children with disabilities. So one is an effort with the collaboration with the Ministry of Education in Peru, um, where we piloted a set of measures um, for teachers working with children with disabilities around their social emotional skills burnout, support, things like that. And, and we'll be sharing information on that, I think, later this year. Um, and then I, I think uh, to um, uh, the point that was raised by the prior panelist about the difficulties in sort of um, children with disabilities being represented in these samples, uh, I just wanted to give a, a shout out to a group, the Xavier Project, um, who is uh, uh, currently being supported by the UNHCR's Humanitarian Education Accelerator. Um, and they are working with refugee-led organizations to work in communities to bring uh, awareness um, of children with disabilities and to provide home and school-based programming. Um, and we're working with them over the, co the coming year to develop measures um, that they can use in their monitoring and evaluation processes. Um, so just two things to look out for coming up in the future. 
Thank you, Carly. Um, we are running short on time. We have so many incredible questions kind of pouring in as we hear all these wonderful responses. So I'm going to share two. We probably only have time for two more responses before we wrap up. Um, I'll post them in the chat so everybody has some for reference. Uh, first question, in conducting evaluations in several conflict-affected countries, I've observed that school counselors or school psychologists are the most stressed and least supported professionals. For example, clinical supervision is either absent or left to individual school counselors or psychologists to organize. Have panelists observed similar uh, relative neglect? Um, of these folks. And then the, the next question I'll pose at the same time. Um, what has been your experience with the acceptance of SEL tools and measures by the various government bodies in different countries? What would be the potential challenges to be mindful of when introducing these measures and tools to the public education sphere? Um, so we probably have time for two, maybe three maximum responses before we wrap up. So I'll turn it over to our panelists to rapid fire some responses to those great questions. Angelica, go ahead. I'll take a very, very quick stab at the issue of assessment and acceptability, uh, because in Colombia, that's one, been one of the major paradigm shifts. I think three key ideas maybe to take with us. One is the importance of understanding the purpose of assessment very, very clearly. And I think probably this audience, that is a little bit of an obvious point. But when this is taken out into sort of spheres outside of research, there can be a lot of confusion as to why we're assessing what the purpose is. Um, two, there has to be a lot of clarity around who the right stakeholders are, right, to position any given assessment. Uh, and sometimes that will involve not only just, of course, the families, the children, but also the larger community and the government in where that is sort of, you know, of relevance. We've done something like that in, in the context of assessment of quality. And one of our biggest challenges was advancing the conversation of child assessments for all the right reasons. Um, and then third, thirdly, I would say, you know, issues aren't just, you know, ethics. I mean, this cannot be, I think, uh, overemphasized. Um, and our role as partners, both national and international, to, to sort of, you know, truly walk with these communities, whoever they might be, again, families, governments, um, because it's complex, right? I think the issue of assessment in general is complex, and particularly when it comes to evaluating uh, a program that could be uh, linked to possibly funding policies, policy or high level decision making. Um, so I really appreciate the, the intent and the spirit of that question. Thank you, Angelica. Rayalina, did you want to speak as well? I think you're muted. I'm not sure if uh, you're sorry, saying I just no, wanted I actually... To, <laughs> I wanted uh, uh, shortly to answer the, the question how to convince the, um, I, the, the decision makers about the importance of emotional social uh, domain of child development or and especially its uh, association with learning. I think that we just, I believe very strongly with the knowledge because there is really pedagogical research also even brain research, which always has a higher voice than we have, uh, which shows that children are learning better when they have, when you have, when you embed, for example, in the curriculum, social emotional skills. So that's not something which is uh, after or not really learning the mathematics or the languages. And I think this is what the colleagues have been doing a great job that they convince with evidence that like that started that playing is important because it increases the learning. So I think that we can use similar arguments also for the social emotional learning as a, also making your children more successful in mathematics and in, in languages and others. That's, that's, I think it's convincing for the decision makers. Thank you, Rayalina. Uh, because we have, uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I'm now going to turn it to Dana Birdie to give some final remarks and, and thank you all again for, for this participation. Over to you, Dana. Thank you so much, Hetty. And thank you so much to all of our authors who have joined us today and all of the audience members. The questions have been fabulous. I wish we had a little bit more time so we could go on and on discussing these issues. I hope you do seek out authors who are on this panel. I'm sure that they would welcome your your contact. 
a contact with you and your questions directly posed to them if you would like. I am jumping the gun a little bit on, on speaking on behalf of our colleagues, but um, I, I, I'm confident that people are so engaged in this discussion that they will be happy to continue it going forward. Let me just highlight a couple of key points that I hear from this conversation and a couple of important points that I think uh, that I'd like to leave you with. First of all, this work exponentially expands what we know about measurement in PSS SEL programs around the world. This um, takes uh, the special issue in PSS and SEL has a significant focus on tools and measurement as you've, as you've heard on validation, on adaptation, and on understanding local contexts when trying to promote programs that work to enhance children's well-being, children and families' well-being. I am thrilled at, at the extent to which this moves the conversation forward that we've been having for a number of years about PSS and SEL, now really putting, um, putting actual articles in place where we previously have just noted that so much research is carried out by high-income countries, in high-income countries, on high-income country um, residents, and by people who live in these countries. Now we are changing that dynamic and have, have significantly shifted the way we look at these questions. I do hope that we maintain this momentum going forward. My question to the panelists that I'd love to leave you with not to answer now, but to take forward is, what are the next steps in the research agenda on PSS and SEL? Where do we go from here? Um, what, kind of, what, kind of, um, what kind of ways would you imagine enhancing these measures in the future or really enhancing what we're after is really enhancing outcomes for children and families everywhere? So I leave you with that question. And before I wrap, us, wrap up the session, I want to just, make sure to thank and acknowledge Dean Brooks, who is the director of INE and who's with us here today, as well as our terrific colleagues at INE who have helped have organized this webinar and have managed it for us. And without whom we wouldn't have events like this today. Finally, Hedy, you are a force of nature. Without Hedy, this, this publication wouldn't have come together as, as you've heard and as you see in this session. So thank you so much again, Hedy, and all of the staff at the journal, Jim and Robin Hill, and all of our authors and audience members for joining us today. I believe that, um, Hedy, I'm not sure if, if I turn it over now to Norad for a final word, or I'll turn it over to you. Thank you all so much. I think you have the final word, Dana, and just everyone know that you'll, you'll hear from INAE with a recording. Um, of this session, and we thank you all so much for your participation and contributions to the, the journal and our work. Um, it's been a really thrilling event. Thank you for being a part of it.